great to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Thank you all for coming out on this uh, cold and rainy evening. I'm, I'm awed that you're all here and so appreciative. Uh, David, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so honored to be able to share the stage uh, with Sue Desmond Hellman, um, the great leader of the Gates Foundation. Um, bless you, whoever did it. <laughs> I'm here tonight to talk about my new book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist's Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations. First question I always get when I tell people the title, thank you for being late, is where does that come from? It actually comes from meeting people in Washington, D.C., where I live for breakfast over the years. And every once in a while, I don't like to waste any meal by eating alone, so I often have business breakfast. And every once in a while, someone would come 10, 15 minutes late. They'd say, Tom, I'm really sorry. It was the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. And spontaneously, one morning, about three years ago, I said to one of them, Peter Corsell, I said, actually, Peter, thank you for being late. Because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. <laughs> Fascinating. I've been people watching the lobby. Fantastic. And most importantly, I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for a month. So thank you for being late. People started to get into it. They'd say, well, 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 well you're welcome. Okay? <laughs> because they, they knew I was actually giving them permission to pause, to reflect, and to rethink. In fact, my favorite quote in the first chapter of the book is from my friend Dove Seidman, who said to me one day, you know, when you press the pause button on a computer, it stops. But when you press the pause button on a human being, it starts. It starts to reflect, to reimagine, to rethink. And boy, do we need to do a lot of that right now. Now, the book actually came about by accident when I paused to engage with someone who I wouldn't normally pause to engage with. Uh, I live in Bethesda, Maryland, outside of DC, and I take the subway to work roughly once a week. And that involves driving from my home in Bethesda to downtown Bethesda, and I park in a public parking garage beneath the Bethesda Hyatt. And I did that some three years ago now, took the red line into D.C., where the New York Times Bureau is, came back at the end of the day, got my car, timestamp ticket, drove to the cashier's booth, gave it to the cashier, and he looked at it, looked at me, and said, I know who you are. I said, great. Um, he said, I read your column. I said, great. He said, I don't always agree. I thought, get me out of here. Um, <laughs> but I actually said, that's great. It, it means you have to check. Um, and I drove off. Anyways, a week or so later, took my weekly trip to D.C., parking garage, red line, back, home, car, timestamp ticket, same guys in the cashier booth. And this time he says, Mr. Friedman, I have my own blog. Would you read my blog? <laughs> this is how the book begins. And I said, well, write it down for me, and I'll take a look at it. So he tore a piece of receipt paper off and wrote odanambi.com. And I took it home. But all the time I'm thinking, oh my god, the parking guy is now my competitor. <laughs> <laughs> what, what just happened? So I got home and I looked it up on my computer, and it turned out he's Ethiopian and writes about Ethiopian politics. He's from the Oromo people, and a real democracy advocate, very important in Ethiopia at this time. Anyways, I told my wife about it, and um, I thought about him for a couple days, and I decided this is a sign from God, um, and I should pause and engage him. 
but I didn't have his email. So um, the only way I could engage him was park in the parking garage every day <laughs> and take the subway, which I did. And after, I don't remember now, three or four days, we overlapped. 7 a.m. in the morning, I parked my car into the gate. I got out. I said, Ayile, now I know his name, Ayile Bougia. I said, Ayile, I would like to send you an email. Could you give me your email? Which he gladly did. And that night, I wrote him an email. I repeat our email exchange. They were quite funny, actually, a few of them back and forth. But I basically said, I have a proposition for you. I will teach you how to write a column if you will tell me your life story. And he basically said, I see you're proposing a deal. I like this deal. <laughs> um, so he asked if we could meet at, near his office uh, at Pete's Coffee House in Bethesda, and we did two weeks later. And I came with a six-page memo on how to write a column, uh, and he came with his life story. Um, he's an economics graduate of Haile Selassie University, became deeply involved in democratic and Oromo politics, um, uh, basically had to come to the States as an exile, was working in the parking garage because he was actually blogging on Ethiopian websites, he told me, but they were, they were too slow. Wouldn't turn his stuff around fast enough. So he decided to start his own blog, and now, Mr. Friedman, I feel empowered. His Google metrics say he's read in 30 countries. This is my parking guy. It's a, it's a great story of how everyone today can participate in the discussion. And we met basically as two opinion writers. I then delivered to him my six-page memo on how to write a column. And I basically, if the world is a big data problem, this is my algorithm. It's how I go about organizing my writing. So I explained to him that a news story is meant to inform. And I can do a news story about this event tonight or the great town hall, and I can inform better or worse. Uh, but a column, an opinion article, is meant to provoke. It's meant to produce a reaction. So I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. That's uh, what I do. I either do heating or lighting. I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or illuminating something for you. And if I really do it well, I do both. And I produce one of several reactions that tell me I provoked you. You might say, I, I never knew that. That's a good reaction. I never looked at it that way. That's a good reaction. I never connected those things. Your favorite, you live for this, happens four times a year. You said exactly what I felt, but didn't know how to say, God bless you. I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. I get that too. That tells me I've <laughs> produced a reaction. Um, any one of those is fine, as far as I'm concerned. But I explained to him that to produce a reaction actually requires an act of chemistry. Because when you're writing news, you're just reacting to something out there. But when you're writing opinion, you really have to conjure it yourself. And you have to combine three compounds. The first is, what is your value set? What is the worldview you're trying to promote? Are you a communist, a capitalist, a neocon, a neoliberal, a libertarian, a Keynesian? What is the value set you're trying to promote? Second, how do you think the machine works? So the machine is my shorthand for what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more ways in more places on more days? As a columnist, I'm always carrying around in my head a working hypothesis of how the machine works. Because what I'm really trying to do is take my value set and push this machine in the direction I think it should go. And if I don't know how it works, or if I, if I don't know how it works, I'll either not push it, or I'll push it in the wrong direction. And third, what have you learned about people and culture, because there's no column without people, and there are no people without culture. How the machine affects them, and how they come back and affect the machine. Stir all those together, let it rise, bake for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you'll produce a column, explained to Ayile, that produces heat or light. Well, we actually met three times and emailed back and forth to go over this. 
And as we went through this process over a period of a couple months, I began to ask myself, it's the first time I ever put it together this way, if that's what a column is about, what's my value set? Where did it come from? Because readers of my column know is, no, I'm not quite a Democrat, certainly not a Republican. I'm actually a very hybrid and eclectic thinker, and it's because my politics didn't come from a library or a philosopher. It actually grew out of the time and place where I grew up in a small suburb of Minneapolis in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I grew up in a time and a place where politics worked. And so basically, a lot of my politics is about how to recreate that wherever I go. My chapter in the book about that is called Always Looking for Minnesota. That's basically what I've been doing for 40 years. So I thought about it, and I also said, well, how do I think the machine works today? And what have I learned about people and culture? And I decided, you know what? I think I'd like to write a book about all of that. And that's what this book is. It's one giant column about the world today. A kind of brief theory of everything with this framework. So let me talk for a few minutes about the guts of the thing, how I think the machine works today. Because I think what's shaping more things in more places and more ways on more days is that we are in the middle of three accelerations, exponential accelerations, all at the same time with the three largest forces on the planet, which I call the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law. So Moore's Law, coined by Gordon Moore in 1965, said the speed and power of microchips will double every 24 months. Now it's probably closer to 30. Never mind, if you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. The market, the market for me is digital globalization, not your grandfather's globalization, containers on ships. That's actually going down. But digital globalization, the way everything is now being digitized and globalized, whether through Facebook or Twitter or Amazon or Microsoft or PayPal, it's this form of globalization that is actually in hyper acceleration. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. And thirdly, Mother Nature. Mother Nature for me is climate change, biodiversity loss, and population growth in the developing world. If you put it on a graph, it looks like a hockey stick. In fact, friends, we are in the middle of three hockey stick accelerations all at the same time in the three largest forces on the planet. And they're all interacting with one another. More Moore's Law drives more globalization. More globalization drives more climate change and more solutions to climate change. And these accelerations, they're not just changing the world. In my view, they are reshaping the world. And they're reshaping five realms in particular, our politics, our geopolitics, our workplace, our ethics, and our communities. The first half of the book is about these accelerations, and the second half is about these reshaped realms and how we should think of them anew. So let's talk a little bit about that acceleration in Moore's Law, which is really the flywheel driving all three of them in many ways. So my chapter on that subject is called What the Hell Happened in 2007? 2007. Seems like such an innocuous year. What's this guy talking about? 2007. Well, here's what happened in 2007. Uh, the year was kicked off when Steve Jobs at the Moscone Center in San Francisco unveiled the iPhone in January. Basically initiating a process by which we are now putting a handheld computer connected to the cloud through the internet in the hands of more and more people on the planet. We have never been at a moment like this where so many people are now walking around with a handheld computer. Oh, but that's not all that happened in 2007. Actually, late 2006, a company called Facebook opened itself up to anyone 
with a registered email address. Before then, it was confined to high school students and university students, and it went global in 2007. In 2007, a company called Twitter actually was born in 2006, but it too launched globally in 2007. In 2007, one of the most important software platforms you've never heard of called Hadoop, named after the founder's son's toy elephant, opened its doors and helped us scale big data. It basically enabled a million computers to work as one. In 2007, a company called GitHub, GitHub, now the world's biggest open source software repository, opened its doors in San Francisco. Now has 13, 14 million participants. In 2007, 2007, a guy down the street here named Jeff Bezos introduced the first ebook reader called the Kindle. In 2007, a company called Google unveiled an open source operating system called Android. In 2007, a company called Google bought a little known media company called YouTube. In 2007, a company called IBM started a computer, a cognitive computer called Watson, the world's first cognitive computer. In 2007, Three roommates in San Francisco who were attending the design conference that year decided to rent out their three extra air mattresses to some participants who couldn't get a hotel room. And they started a company called Airbnb. In 2007, Change.org was born. In 2007, Palantir was born. In 2007, Michael Dell, who retired in 2005, decided he had to come back to work in 2007. 2007, Intel, for the first time, went off silicon in the manufacturing of its microchips and introduced non-silicon materials into its transistors to extend the exponential of Moore's law. Here's what else happened in 2007. This is a graph of the cost of sequencing the human genome. Um, we get over here. So um, in 2001, it cost $100 million to sequence a human genome. Then you'll see it sort of goes down a little bit to $10 million in 2005, 2006, and then suddenly, it, like a waterfall, goes straight down. Trace your finger down to the year 2007. Today, it's about $1,200. Solar power took off in 2007, as did a process for extracting natural gas from tight shale called fracking. 2007, this is the cost of, a graph of cost of generating a megabit of data. This, this is basically what social networks look like. The cost of generating a megabit of data, that white line, goes straight down. And the blue line is the speed at which you can transmit that data. The two lines cross in 2008. Close enough for government work. <laughs> this is what Moore's Law looks like. And this, of course, is the history of cloud computing. It begins in 2007. Turns out, friends, that 2007 may be understood in time as the single greatest technological inflection point since Gutenberg invented the printing press and we completely missed it <laughs> because of 2008. <laughs> so what basically happened in 2007 is our physical technologies just leapt ahead. It was like we were all on a moving sidewalk at an airport that suddenly went from 5 miles an hour to 35 miles an hour, and we all felt it. The ground's moving under my feet. And at the same time, our social technologies, the learning, the adapting, the regulating, the deregulating, the political reform, all the things you needed to go with this to get the most out of it and cushion the worst, many of those just froze. And we are still living in that dislocation. So my friend Astro Teller, who runs Google X, Google's research arm, I was going over this with him one day, just telling him what I was seeing, and he went over to his whiteboard, 
And he just sketched out on his whiteboard this very crude graph that he said probably explains where we are. So the blue line is the average rate at which human beings adapt to change over time and societies. It has a positive slope because we learn gradually faster and faster, but it's very gradual. The white line is technology. So if you lived back here in the 11th century or 12th century, actually your life didn't change very much at all. I mean, there was a time when your life didn't change over 100 years. And then we got Copernicus and Galileo and the Renaissance and the Reformation and eventually Intel and Microsoft and everything, and the line starts to go straight up the curve. And then Astro drew, drew, drew a little diamond there, and he wrote the words, we are here. In other words, we're living now in a time where the pace of technological change is the change in the pace of change is now faster than many humans and communities can adapt. So our challenge, he said, then he took out another white um, a magic marker and he drew a dotted line off the blue line and he said, that's our challenge. We have to learn faster and govern smarter. Lift the line of adaptation. And that's really the challenge we face today. Now, how did this happen? Well, what I argue in the book is basically, if you think about the computer, it has five parts. It's got the CPU, the processor, the storage chip, the networking, the software, and the sensor. And I basically do a mini history of all five, and I explain that basically what happened in 2007 is they all reached a certain tipping point and melded together in something that we call the cloud. The cloud. But I actually don't use the term the cloud in my book because it sounds so soft. <laughs> sounds, sounds so cuddly, so fluffy, so benign. It sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. <laughs> uh, I've looked at clouds from both sides. <laughs> this isn't a cloud. It's what my friend from Microsoft, Craig Mundy, calls a supernova. It really is now. The supernova is the biggest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. Only this supernova just keeps exploding at an ever-accelerating rate. What basically happened in, in the early 2000s is, in my view, two price collapses. First, right around the year 1999, we had a price collapse in fiber optic cable, thanks to the dot-com boom, bubble, and bust. Honey, I accidentally wired the world. Fiber optic cable became so cheap that the world moved from interconnected to interdependent. And we could suddenly touch people who we could never touch before. We could be touched by people who could never touch us before. I knew it happened when I called home to Minneapolis to my 80-year-old mom, and she told me I was disturbing her because she was playing bridge on the internet with someone in Siberia. Okay? <laughs> I gave that moment a name in 2005. I said the world is flat. Just to uh, describe that sense of interdependence and connectivity. I actually wrote a 2.0 edition of The World is Flat in 2006. I wrote a 3.0 edition in 2007. And then I stopped because I thought I had it all figured out. <laughs> As my stockbroker said to me one day, 2007 was a very bad year to stop sniffing glue, okay? <laughs> um, and a very bad year to stop writing about technology, but that's just what I did. I only discovered what happened after, because what happened after was another price collapse, that the synthesis, what the cloud and all these things produced was a collapse in the price of compute and storage. And we made compute and storage. We were able to now do what I call in the book, quoting a GE engineer, we were able to begin to make complexity free. 
we were able to abstract now more and more complexity in more and more ways and inject Greece everywhere. So what was it to get a taxi in Seattle five years ago? Taxi, I'm at town hall, it's raining. Th 30 minutes? And they didn't believe it was going to be 30 minutes, and neither did you. <laughs> Today we all know it's one touch. And in that one touch, we abstract the ability to summon a cab, direct a cab, pay the cab, and rate the driver. All with one touch. Now, all that complexity is being abstracted. Now when you make connectivity fast, free, easy for you, and ubiquitous, and you make complexity fast, free, easy for you, and invisible, the world starts to feel very fast. And that's really what we're feeling all today. It was those two things that came together around 2007. And this election, we can talk about later, in part was about how this has unmoored and unanchored now so many people. So, I won't talk to you about the acceleration in globalization, it's driven by this, or in climate change, you, you know that we can talk about it after. Let me just take a few minutes before we invite Sue up to talk about what the impl how this is reshaping several different realms. So I have a chapter on how this is reshaping the workplace. That chapter is called How We Turn AI into IA. How do we turn artificial intelligence into intelligent assistance, A-N-C-E, intelligent assistance, A-N-T-S, and intelligent algorithms so we can help more people basically adapt faster to the change in the pace of change. So my example of intelligent assistance is the Human Resources Department at AT&T, where I was able to spend some time in working on this book. Big company, 360,000 employees. Um, in living in a highly competitive environment, wakes up every morning and competes with Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint, Deutsche Telekom, etc. They're living right next to the supernova. They feel its heat every day. So what AT&T does now is their CEO, Randall Stevenson, begins the year with a radically transparent speech on where they're going as a company. Um, what kind of markets they think they're going to be in, and what skills you now need to be an AT&T employee. Uh, then they put all their employees on their own in-house LinkedIn system. And, um, you know, if David were on that system, they'd say, David, 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 um, there are 10 skills you now need to be an AT&T employee in this age of accelerations, and, and you've got seven of them. But you're missing three. Then they partnered with Sebastian Thrun from Udacity, who created um, nano degrees for all 10. Then they came to their employees and said, we will give you up to $8,500 a year to take these courses. Uh, one is a $6,000 online computer science master's degree from Georgia Tech. We will give you up to $8,500 a year if you take these courses. There's just one condition. You have to take them on your own time. If David says, you know, I've climbed up one too many telephone poles, I'm just not up for this anymore, AT&T now has a wonderful severance package for him. But he won't be working at AT&T. Their bargain with him is very simple. If he takes these courses, they will guarantee that he gets the first crack, he gets a first crack at any new job. They won't go outside. The basically new social contract between AT&T and their employees is you can be a lifelong employee at AT&T, still, but only if you're a lifelong learner. And that's basically the new social contract coming to a neighborhood near you. The days when you could get a four-year BA and dine out on that for 30 years are long gone. If you are ready to be a lifelong learner, you can be a lifelong employee. Now, they are being a responsible company by creating actually the economic conditions and the learning conditions for you to be a lifelong learner. But more will be on you. You will have to do it on your own time. That's intelligent assistance. Intelligent assistant, I profile Qualcomm. And Qualcomm uh, is in San Diego, a very important company you also probably haven't heard much about. They actually make a lot of the guts and software of your cell phone. 
They aren't really a consumer-facing company. So what they did recently was actually they put sensors on uh, a bunch of their buildings and their campus in San Diego. But they put sensors on everything, every door, every window, every heating, air conditioning unit, every computer, every light, every faucet, every pipe. And they took all that data and beam it up to the, to the supernova, and then they beam it down onto an iPad for their janitorial staff. Really um, uh, user-friendly interface. So they know if you leave your computer on, they know if you leave your door open, they know if you left the heating or air conditioning on, they know when something breaks, when a pipe bursts, they can swipe down and see who the repairman is or even find the manual there. They've made their janitors into maintenance technologists. And they actually give tours sometimes to foreign visitors. Now think what that does for the dignity and the motivation of a janitor. He's now got an intelligent assistant helping him live above the line. My example of intelligent algorithm is the partnership between the College Board and um, uh, Khan Academy. So the College Board, they're the people who uh, do the SAT and the PSAT. Uh, you all look sort of roughly my age. I'm 63. I had two girls when they were in high school in 11th grade. When you have to take the PSAT, I did what a lot of our neighbors did. We hired a college kid to tutor them to lift their scores in math and English and whatnot. Yeah, yeah I know you did it too. And um, <laughs> really helped them, but it was a completely rigged game. Because if you came from a disadvantaged family or a neighborhood or school, you probably didn't even know this was available. And if you did, you couldn't afford it. A completely rigged game. So two and a half years ago, the College Board partnered with Khan Academy, Sal Khan's online learning platform, to create free SAT prep. Now you take your PSAT exam in 11th grade. I get my results back. It says, Tom, Tom, Tom. Uh, you, did, you did well in math, but you have a problem with fractions and right angles. And then it takes me to a practice site just for fractions and right angles. Exactly my weakness. If I do well there, it comes back and says, Tom, have you ever thought about taking AP math? Maybe I didn't even know there was AP math. But you could actually do it. And if I do well, there's another site that takes me to 180 or more now different college scholarships, and another that takes me to a connection with boys and girls clubs that offer coaches to help me through this. It's an intelligent algorithm, and last year, Two million American kids participate in it and got free SAT college prep. That's an intelligent assistant. You know, algorithm. Had you listened to our recent election campaign, you would know none of this. Okay? You would know none of this. And, um, and that's actually tragic. Bernie Sanders' big idea was take down the banks. Donald Trump's big idea was take down Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Hillary Clinton's big idea was go to my website. Okay? Nobody is telling people about actually the massive amount of, of, of intelligent assistance, assistance, and algorithms that people are innovating all over the country. Anyways, that's what the chapter is about. I have a chapter on the reshaping of politics. Uh, it's called Mother Nature's Political Party. Because um, basically what I think is happening in the country and the world today is we're actually going through three climate changes at once. We're going through a change in the climate. We're going through a change in the climate of globalization. Global, the world's going from interconnected to interdependent. And we're going through a change in the climate of technology. Uh, the world is just flat, it's fast. So what happens when you go through climate change? What do you want? You actually want two things. You want resilience, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. And you want propulsion. You want to be able to move ahead. You don't want to be curled up in a ball. So I thought to myself, who do I interview about how you produce resilience when the climate changes? Then I realized I knew this woman. She's 3.8 billion years old. Her name is Mother Nature. And she's dealt with more climate changes than anybody. So I sat her down and I interviewed her. I said, Mother Nature, what are your killer apps for dealing, producing resilience 
and propulsion when the climate change. He said, well, Tom, everything I do, I do unconsciously. But here's what I do. First of all, I'm incredibly adaptive in a brutal way through natural selection. My rule is only the adaptive survive. I'm incredibly adaptive. Uh, second, she says, I love pluralism and diversity. Um, I try 20 different species, see who wins. My most diverse ecosystems are my most resilient ecosystems. Third, she says, I'm incredibly sustainable in a very circular way. Everything is food, nothing is wasted. Eat food, poop, seed, eat food, poop, seed. I'm very sustainable. Fourth, she said, I'm incredibly entrepreneurial. Wherever I see an opening in nature, I fill it with a plant or animal perfectly adapted to that niche. Fifth, she says, I really believe in ownership. Oh, when there's ownership in the room, good things happen. When an ecosystem is in balance, it owns that space. It's highly resilient to invasive species. Seventh, she says, I'm incredibly heterodox. I mix all kinds of things together the right bees with the right flowers, the right trees with the right soils. Lastly, she said, I do believe in the laws of bankruptcy. I kill all my failures, return them to the great manufacturer in the sky, and I take their energy to nourish my successes. My argument is that the political party, the country, the community, that most closely mirrors Mother Nature's apps will be the most resilient and propulsive in the age of acceleration. And just to drive the point home, I imagined what would happen had Mother Nature run in this election, and I created Mother Nature's political party, which of course is just a surrogate for my own politics. <laughs> and, um, and I explained that um, if Mother Nature were running, like me, um, on some issues, she'd be to the left of Bernie Sanders. Uh, I'm for single-payer health care. Uh, I think we have to uh, have, it's, um, if Sweden can do it and Singapore can do it, I just do not understand how we can't make that work. And I believe our safety nets and our trampolines are going to have to become much more effective in the age of acceleration because it's going to be too fast for some people. But at the same time, I'm actually to the right of the Wall Street Journal editorial page because I would actually abolish all corporate taxes and replace them with a carbon tax, a tax on bullets, a tax on sugar, and a small financial transaction tax. So I want to get actually, um, I want to get radically entrepreneurial over here to pay for the safety nets we're going to need over here. The problem with our politics and the reason all our parties are blowing up here and in Europe is if you're for radical entrepreneurship, you can't be for stronger safety nets. If you're for stronger safety nets, you can't be for radical entrepreneurship. That is simply unsustainable. The two have to co-evolve. So our political parties are blowing up because they are basically designed to deal with the New Deal, the Industrial Revolution, the early IT revolution, and civil rights, both racial and gender. And I believe what politics is about going forward is how you respond to the great accelerations, all three, how you develop policies that will allow us to get the best out of these accelerations and to cushion the worst. So I think this disintegration of our parties is just at the beginning, um, and I personally won't miss them. I look forward uh, to this transition. So um, let me conclude by talking about a chapter that some people are surprised in the book, and that's how ethics are going to have to be reimagined in the age of acceleration. And the chapter is called, Is God in Cyberspace? And the title of the chapter comes from uh, one of the best questions I ever got on book tour. It was in Portland in 1999. Um, uh, I believe at the Portland Theater, I was selling Lexus in the olive tree, and a man stood up in the balcony and said, Mr. Friedman, is God in cyberspace? I said, I I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I'm, I felt like an idiot. I didn't know what to say. So I got home and I called my spiritual teacher. He's a rabbi in Amsterdam named Svi Marx. I got to know him at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem when I was the New York Times correspondent there. Great Talmudic scholar. I called him up. Svi, I said, I got a question I've never had before. Is God in cyberspace? 
what should I have said? And he said, you know, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. Um, one is that he's a biblical concept and a post-biblical concept, excuse me. The biblical concept says that the Almighty is Almighty. He smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace, which is full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, <laughs> prevarication, and we now know fake news, okay? Uh, but Svi said, we also have a post-biblical view of God that says God manifests himself by how we behave. So if we want God to be in cyberspace, we have to bring him there by how we behave there. Well, I put that answer into the paperback edition of Lexus and the Olive Tree in the year 2000 and completely forgot about it, and nobody saw it. As I was working on this book, I found myself retelling that story. And I finally said to myself, why are you retelling that story now? And the answer immediately became obvious. It's because everything in our lives, or so many things in our lives, are moving to cyberspace. It's now where we find a spouse. It's where we meet our friends. It's where we educate, where we do business. Everything is moving to a realm where we're all connected, but no one's in charge. There's actually no value system there, as we've discovered in this election. Fake news, no problem. Who can check? Big story in the paper today of a Russian bank got hacked, lost $31 million. Everything's moving to a realm where we're all connected, but, but no one's in charge. And the other reason I knew I was bringing it up, because in this age of accelerations, it's a wonderful time to be a maker, but it's also a great time to be a breaker. Because when the world is good for makers, it's good for breakers, and we are seeing super-empowered breakers now who can act like governments. So for both those reasons, I was bringing it up, and that's when I realized that we are now standing at a moral intersection we've never stood at before. In 1945, post-Hiroshima, we entered a world where one country could kill all of us. And if it had to be one country, I'm glad it was ours. I think we're entering a world now where one person can kill all of us. We're not there yet, but that's where we're going. And all of us could actually fix everything. The same amplified powers of the age of acceleration enable one of us to kill all of us sooner or later, but for all of us to actually fix everything, to feed, house, clothe, and educate every person on the planet, if we so chose. In other words, friends, we have actually never been more godlike as a species. We have never been this godlike. And if we are going to be godlike, everybody better have the golden rule. Do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. Whatever version your faith has, and every faith has a version, because we now live in a world where more people can do unto you from farther away and you can do unto more people farther away than ever before. Now, I know what you're thinking because I gave this part of the talk as the commencement address at Olin College of Engineering last spring in Needham, Massachusetts. And I said to the parents there, I know what you're thinking. You just paid 200 grand so your kid could get an engineering degree and there's a knucklehead commencement speaker talking about the need to scale the golden rule, could there be anything more naive? And my answer is, naivete is the new realism. Because what's really naive is thinking we're going to be okay in a world with this much amplified individual power where we are this interdependent if we don't scale the golden rule. How do you scale the golden rule? It only happens two ways, basically. Strong families and healthy communities. That's where people learn to do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. And that's why my book ends. I don't know much about how to build a strong family. I tried to do that with my own, but I wouldn't pretend to be an expert. But I actually do know a lot about healthy communities because I grew up in one in this town called St. Louis Park, this suburb town 
outside of Minneapolis, where I grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The short story is, and this is where the book ends, uh, Minneapolis in the 40s was the capital of anti-Semitism uh, until Hubert Humphrey became mayor. Hubert Humphrey began his civil rights crusade working on Jews and Gentiles before he got to blacks and whites. He purged the city government of anti-Semitism. In the mid-50s, the Jews who all lived in the north side of Minneapolis with African Americans in a ghetto, basically, the Jews were able to break out and they all moved basically almost all to one suburb, the one that didn't have redlining, St. Louis Park. So overnight, a suburb that was 100% Protestant Catholic and Scandinavian became 20% Jewish, 80% Protestant Catholic Scandinavian. If Sweden and Israel had a baby, it would be St. Louis Park, okay? <laughs> and you had this crazy clash of neurotic Jews and these really pluralistic, um, even-tempered Swedes. And in this crazy clash came my high school and Hebrew school and our community. I grew up in roughly the same time and place in those institutions with the Cone brothers, Al Franken, Norm Ornstein, Michael Sandel, Peggy Ornstein, Alan Wiseman, um, Dan Wilson, who wrote Someone Like You with Adele. We all went basically through the same schools, Hebrew school and neighborhood during that 15-year period. The Cone brothers movie, A Serious Man, was about St. Louis Park. Okay? It was a freaky place. This was not a Upper West Side neighborhood. This was a single little town in Minnesota. And the reason it threw off all these people is that we all grew up in what eventually was, and we worked hard at this. It took a while. But we grew up in an inclusive, pluralistic community, be it what as it may. And our challenge of pluralism was basically to bring white Judeo-Christians together. And I tell the story how we, the Jews, we called ourselves the frozen chosen, were able to, um, uh, uh, able to come together with these remarkable Scandinavians. So, I tell that story, and then the last chapter in the book is, I come back 40 years later, my same high school. Now it's 50% white Protestant Catholic, 10% Hispanic, it's 10% Jewish, and it's 30% Somali and African American. Because the same suburb that was ready to take the Jews 50 years ago was ready to take the Somalis. Now the inclusion challenge is much deeper, much wider, both racially and religiously. And I tell the story of how they're doing, and they're not doing too bad. But ain't that the story of America today? And ain't that the challenge of the world, how we build a healthy community where people can feel connected, respected, and protected from these diverse elements. And so my book uh, concludes with, uh, it has a theme song. Um, it's by a Seattle native, Brandy Carlisle. I'm a big Brandy Carlisle fan. <laughs> and uh, it's her song, The Eye, which I think is the anthem of our time. Uh, its main refrain is, I wrap my love around you like a chain, but I never was afraid that it would die. You can dance in a hurricane, but only if you're standing in the eye. And I believe my three accelerations, they are like a hurricane. Some people are selling a wall against the hurricane. I'm arguing for an eye, an eye that moves with the storm, draws energy from it, but creates a platform of dynamic stability within it, precisely where people can feel connected, protected, and respected. I believe our politics in the next four years is going to be a struggle here and globally between the wall people and the eye people, and my book is a manifesto for the eye people. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Where's Sue? Thank you. Thank you. Sue, so you sit there and I'll sit over here.
Thank you very much. Wow, have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you. That was amazing. Appreciate it. So I knew that I would get to be here this evening with all of these wonderful uh, uh, fellow Seattleites. Can't hear you? I turned it on, I swear. <laughs> it's not, it's, no, no? Can you hear now? No. Oh. How about now? <laughs> Is there a handheld mic? Oh, let me get that. Is that a handheld? Let me see. Hold on one second. I think it is. Is it? No, I guess that's fixed. Uh, no, it's fixed. Sorry. Where's the mic person? Is that? There we go. Here we go. Let's turn it on. How about now? Ah! <laughs> Thank you. So, so knowing that we would be together tonight, I not only read your wonderful book, um, but I thought I should watch the movie. Uh, <laughs> and I would highly recommend the, A Serious Man. Um, mm. you, you talked about it at the end, but one of the things I think is the most thrilling part of reading this book is that it's a little bit of a sneaky autobiography. <laughs> Maybe not so sneaky. Yeah. And so what I loved most is it's you as a son, it's you as a husband, it's you as a father. And I thought that given there's probably so many people who have lived that experience and gone through what you did growing up in a community, one of the, the things you talk about is thinking about your daughters and you needed to get a job they need to think about defining what work looks like for them. Yes. Can you talk some more? You mentioned your AI and IA, yeah. but, but as a parent, how do you think about work and the future of work, given that advice you gave your daughters? Uh, it's a really, it's a good question, Sue, and thank you so much for doing this. Um, well, you know, what I always say is I, when I graduated from college, I got to find a job. Uh, my girls will have to invent a job. Um, and I think that's the big difference between us, uh, in that I could find a job, and basically I've worked at the New York Times for 36 years. Um, the chances of my girls working where they work, one works at NPR, and one actually is the, um, uh, the um, uh, director of the Khan Academy Lab School's lower school. So um, uh, that's why I know a lot about Khan Academy. And, um, but I see them inventing and reinventing their jobs so many more times than, than I had to do. So whenever people come to me and ask for advice, you know, about, you know, what do you tell your kids? Um, I, I tell them, well, you know, I, I sort of have uh, five pieces of advice for my daughters, and they're sick of it, but these people are fresh meat, so, so I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll share it with them. Um, first, I tell my daughters, always think like an immigrant. How does the new immigrant think? Um, the new immigrant thinks, I just showed up here in Seattle, and there's no legacy spot waiting for me at the University of Seattle. I better figure out what's going on here and pursue it with more energy, vigor, and persistence and grit than anybody else. Uh, an Armenian friend of mine taught me that new immigrants are paranoid optimists. You know, they're, they're optimists because they came from somewhere bad, usually, to somewhere they thought would be better, but they're always paranoid it can be taken away from them. So think like an immigrant, because we're actually all new immigrants to the age of acceleration. Um, second, I tell them, think like an artisan. So who is the artisan? The artisan was that person in the Middle Ages before mass manufacturing who made every item individually. Every item one-off. Every shoe, every stirrup, every saddle, every table, desk, chair, lamp, stirrup and saddle, the artisan made individually. And what did the best artisan do? They brought so much human creativity to what they did. The best artisans, we know what they did. They carved their initials into their work. Do your job every day as if you wanted to, at the end of the day, you brought so much unique extra to it, you want to carve your initials into it. Third, I tell them, um, uh, this is an idea I got from Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn, um, always think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley. You know, Reed likes to say in Silicon Valley there's only one four-letter word. It's actually not four letters, but it, it does start with an F. Um, uh, and that word is finished. If you ever think of yourself as a finished product, you're probably finished, okay? Um, uh, Reed's motto is always think of yourself as being in beta. 
in that state of the development of a piece of software, when it's about 85% done, you throw it over the wall, the community finds all the errors, the holes, the zero days, they throw it back, you work on it some more, you throw it back over the wall. Reach Mountain is always be in beta. Always think of yourself in the process of relearning, retooling, and re-engineering. Uh, fourth, I, I tell them, always remember, this is my favorite equation, PQ plus CQ is always greater than IQ. Uh, you give me a young person with a high passion quotient and a high curiosity quotient, oh, I'll take them over a kid with a high intelligence quotient seven days a week in this age of accelerations. And, and lastly, I tell them a lesson from Minnesota. Always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House in Minneapolis, <laughs> um, my favorite restaurant. And this came out of my last book because I was having breakfast at Perkins back in 2011 with my best friend Ken Greer on a Sunday morning. 7 a.m., and um, I ordered three buttermilk pancakes and scrambled eggs. And Ken ordered three buttermilk pancakes and fruit. And after 15 minutes, the waitress came, she put down her two plates, and all she said to Ken was, I gave you extra fruit, that's all she said. I gave her a 50% tip. Why did I give her a 50% tip? Because that waitress didn't control much, but she controlled the fruit ladle. And <laughs> that was her source the source of her extra, her unique value add. What was that waitress doing in her own little world? She was acting entrepreneurially. Whatever you do, whether you're at the Gates Foundation, the New York Times, a local business startup or hospital, always think entrepreneurially. Where can I fork off and start a new business, a new opportunity? So if you take nothing away from this talk tonight, friends, please tell your kids this. Always think like an immigrant and stay hungry. Think like an artisan and take pride. Think like a starter upper in Silicon Valley and always be in beta. Remember that PQ plus CQ will always trump IQ. And always, always think like a waitress at Perkins Pancake House. <laughs> and and be, be relentlessly entrepreneurial. So, that's great. You get the ladle. Yeah. Get, the, get the fruit Be ladle. relentlessly that's, entrepreneurial, that's whatever you do. So, so I'm really struck, and I love that you, you uh, started your your book and this evening with the story um, about your parking in the parking lot. And um, I'm just struck by your ability to see things through the eyes of others. Um, talk to us about how you listen and how you think about people and how that informs your amazing career and this amazing book. Um. Well, you know, I really, uh, and, and we got to talk about this a little this morning at the Gates Foundation. Um, so I interview people everywhere I go. Um, I carry my laptop around, I'm famous for this, and, um, uh, and I just, if you get in my orbit, there's a good chance I'll interview you, you know, because uh, I'm really curious about people. And so, and that's how I learn. You know, there's a lot of stuff, data, big data, you know, people criticize me because I'm always just talking to people. And I always like to say to all these pollsters, you know, talking to another human being is actually a form of data. <laughs> and had all of us, myself included, done more of that in this campaign, you know, some journalists and pollsters might not have been so surprised. So um, young people come to me often and say, I want to do what you do. What do I need to know? And I say, look, you really need to know how to type fast. I can really type fast. I actually went to secretarial school in London to learn how to type, so I can type fast. Um, uh, you need to know some literature and grammar and English and history and science. It's all good. But there's two things I think you need to be a good journalist, in, in my experience. Um, one is you have to like people. Um, you have to really enjoy um, listening to the crazy things they say and do. Um, and if you, if you can't hear the music, you'll never be able to play the music. So I the way I'm just wired, the way I came out of my, my mom's womb, you know, is that I just like people, and I like hearing and really get off on the crazy stories they will tell you. Um, but the more important thing is that, um, or the equally important thing, is um, uh, I'm a big believer that listening is the key to journalism, it's also the key to life. Um, and, uh, you know, I got a lot of my, I really began my career um, uh, as a little Jewish guy in the Minnesota, from Minnesota, covering the Arab world. And that was no easy trick. And people who follow me know that I didn't cover it by saying, you're all great, you're all wonderful, it's all the Jews' fault. You know, I was, <laughs> I was, in, I was in people's face on both sides. And I wrote a book called Beirut to Jerusalem that reflected that. And, um, 
but my secret of survival um, was I discovered um, the incredible power of listening. And listening is so important as a journalist, not just because what you learn, and you'll learn a lot, but it's actually much more important because listening is a sign of respect. And if you just sit down and listen to someone, whether they're Israeli, a Palestinian, a Persian, a Saudi, and I mean really listening, deep listening, not just waiting for them to stop talking. But if you actually listen to people, and they sense, wow, Sue is really listening to me, it's amazing what they'll let you say back. And if you don't listen to them, you can't tell them it's dark outside right now. And so um, I learned a long time ago the single most powerful human emotion is humiliation. And it's flip side of respect. That's just two sides of a, of a coin. And boy, if our last election, if that wasn't in play big time. And so um, I try to like people, uh, that comes naturally. Um, I try to be a good listener, I had to train myself for that. Um, but to me, that's really what journalism is about. That's great, I mean, we, we mm -hmm. talked about that after you uh, talked to us at the Gates Foundation. I think that, that's really profound and you know, as a physician, I think we, we call that bedside manner. Yeah. Uh, um, but I think as a journalist, it really allows you to to provide the kind of rich stories that you do both on stage and in well, you know, your just book. To, add, to add one thing, so that's mm -hmm. because I really learned as a journalist, people don't listen through their ears, they listen through their stomach. So if you connect with people at a gut level, mm -hmm. their attitude is, Tom, I don't need to hear the details. I, I trust you. Yeah. And if you don't connect with people at the gut level, you can't show them enough details. Could I see those details one last time? Yeah. One more time. <laughs> and so... Um, there are politicians who understand some people listen through their stomachs, some people listen through yeah. their ears. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask another question, but I'm, I'm only going to ask one more because there's so many people. So start getting your questions and come to we the mic. We have mics. microphone there and there. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned the election, and, and uh, uh, David, my colleague from PATH, talked about what a special region this is in Seattle and King County yes. and how much this community cares about the world. Um, you know, we like to say at the Gates Foundation, all lives have equal value. Yeah. And, and we're global thinkers. How would you think about um, globalism, given the election we've just been through, given Brexit, given what happened yeah. in Italy and France? The world is changing as fast as you define in your book, but it's specifically changing in some ways against our global thinking right. that we affirm and care about so much in this community. How do you think about that given the times we're in? No, it's a, it's a really um, uh, important question. So, so um, I, I think first of all, you, you gotta keep your head at these moments and not, I mean, let's remember Brexit barely passed and Donald Trump actually lost the popular vote. So it's very dangerous to say, Americans now feel X. Uh, Brits now feel, I'm not denying the results of the election, I'm, an electoral college majority here, a, a majority in, in England voted that way. So clearly they're sending a signal. But the reaction shouldn't be, well, let's sweep everything away now and put up walls. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The reaction to me is, how do we get the best out of this and cushion the worst? And maybe we haven't been doing a, a good enough job in cushioning the worst. Um, so I think that's got to be part of the response. Where have we failed? Okay. Um, but I confess, um, my friend Bill Maher, said this to me the first time, and, and I share it. I'm also angry at the people who are angry. Um, because they don't always come with wonderfully, you know, pure, clean hands as well. And, and what I mean by that is this, that um, uh, I have a quote from a congressman from Minnesota in the book. He talked about growing up in Minnesota in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is really, we now know, the golden era for the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in many ways, and um, uh, I mean, in terms of this, I didn't mean that, I meant in terms of blue collar and white collar work, uh, it was an era where you could get high wages for middle skills. And um, uh, this congressman said, growing up in, you know, in Minnesota, to be an average worker in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you needed a plan to fail. You needed a plan to fail. There was so much wind at your back, so much blue collar and white collar work. I had an uncle who only went to high school who worked as a loan officer in a bank. Impossible today, but 
That was possible then. And um, the big difference today is you need a plan to succeed. And you need to update it every six months. And um, uh, I didn't do that, you didn't do that. That's the product of these changes. And there are some people who uh, I think are, really want to have that plan, but don't have the tools. And I wrote this book in part for them. There are other people who make just really bad choices. Um, and read Hillbilly Elegy. Um, that's really J.D. Vance's conclusion, you know, when he looked around. These people married the wrong people, they had kids without being ready to parent them, they made really bad choices. And, um, and now they want the government to bail them out. So I, I hate to sound like some cranky libertarian, but um, <laughs> not everything is somebody else's fault. And um, so I'm a huge believer in the book that... Um, uh, <laughs> You're not the only cranky libertarian. Yes, I mean, it's, it's uh, <laughs> but I, I have a whole section in the book in the Mother Nature chapter on the power of ownership and why I'm a huge believer in the dictum that in the history of the world, in the history of all mankind, no one has ever washed a rented car, okay? I mean, and... Um, <laughs> uh, no one and has so ever washed a rented, rented car. No one has ever... And I know every There's time I say this, someone calls up and says, I washed a rented car. Okay, what a, let's say virtually no one has ever washed a rented car. So I'm a huge believer in the power of ownership. My daughter, who runs a lower school at the Khan Academy Lab School, I, I was having a conversation with her over Thanksgiving, and I said to her, um, honey, what's the, what you, what's the key innovation you're introducing at your school? And she said, Dad, it's one thing. It's ownership. So every kid, starting at five years old, has a weekly contract with their teacher. What are they going to accomplish that week? And they do this everywhere, throughout every week, every year, and throughout every grade. So when they graduate, those kids, in 12th grade, there's one thing they know. They own their future. Um, and it's on them. It's on them. It's on us as a society to give people the tools but they know they can own their future. And where ownership is in the room, where a teacher owns their classroom, where uh, a student owns their education, where your employees and staff own their responsibilities in a big way, good things happen. And um, when ownership isn't in the room, bad things happen. And so I want to think about, again, how I cushion the worst and, and help the best, but... Um, you know, there's other people have pointed out the most important word on Donald Trump's hat, make America great again, was the word again. That people want something again. And, and that's going to be hard in this age of acceleration. And we've got to navigate a way. And I have enormous sympathy for people. If I were 50 years old and just lost my job um, because my company moved somewhere or a robot sat down next to me, studied my job and then replaced me, I'd be angry too. So I have enormous sympathy for that. And I will tell you, I don't have a simple answer for it. Um, but all I know is that we've been through these changes before. 98% of Americans once worked in agriculture, and then in industry, and then services, and we're moving down that chain, and it's a lot harder now. So I don't have a simple answer for that. I just know one thing. I know what the wrong answer is. I'm sure of that. And that's to put up a wall. Because um, that's actually not to trust America. Um, and so, you know, I would say if horses could have voted, there never would have been cars, all right? Because um, uh, <laughs> they would have said to that. And if taxi drivers could vote, there'd never be Uber. And if Marriott could vote, there'd never be Airbnb, right. you know? And so I, I get that. And hey, if I could vote, there wouldn't be algorithms now that can write news stories. And, um, uh, and soon, I'm sure, editorials. I, I, I have no doubt. And so they probably already are. So I, I know there's that change going on, but at the same time, history tells you we've always found new ways. And, and I think the new way, and this is the subtext of the book and why it's called Thank You for Being Late, because it's actually a celebration of everything old and slow. The book is a celebration of the fact that I have come to the conclusion that what matters most in life and everywhere are all the things you can't download. It's all the things you have to upload the old-fashioned way with good parenting and good teaching and strong community. 
And that was what I learned in writing the books, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that time and again, it was these human-to-human -human connections that I found were the decisive thing. I, I have a wonderful quote in the book from uh, Vivek Murthy, who's our Surgeon General. He's an amazing doctor, Indian-American, married to a Chinese-American, only in America, okay? And uh, we were talking one day about disease. And um, I asked him, what's the most prevalent disease in America today? Is it diabetes, is it heart disease, or is it cancer? And he said, it's none of those. It's isolation. And I thought, wow, we live in the most connected age in history. And the Surgeon General of America telling me the most prevalent disease in the country is people feeling isolated and depressed as a result. And, well, that tells me many things. One is that there's going to be a huge business, occupation, and career in making people feel connected, protected, and respected. And a robot can't do that. And so, you know, if I could just read one paragraph from the book, because um, it's, it's the one at the end where I sort of come to this conclusion, and um, I said, uh, don't get me wrong, technology has so much to offer to make us more productive, healthier, more learned, and more secure. I'm awed by the intelligent assistance I discovered in researching this book and the potential it has to lift so many people out of poverty and discover talent and make it possible for us to actually fix everything. I'm hardly a technophobe, but we will get the best out of these technologies only if we don't let them distract us from making these deep human connections, addressing these deep human longings, and inspiring these deep human energies. And whether we do that depends on all that stuff you can't download. The high five from a coach, the praise from a mentor, the hug from a friend, the hand up from a neighbor, the handshake from a rival, the totally unsolicited gesture of kindness from the stranger, the smell of a garden, not the cold stare of a wall. So, um, right. uh, <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, so. So, questions? So, Tom, following on that, um, you know, one of the great things about technology is access to information, mm -hmm. like your friend at the garage, but in this election it's been reported half of Americans got their news from non-mainstream sources. Yeah. So um, how do we solve this uh, conundrum and, and what are its impacts? I opinion? can give you a very short answer. I don't know. You know, um, uh, uh, you know this is it's so new and it's coming on. And um, you know, my, 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 my cheesy but realis realistic answer is, you know, get your news from curated news sources. I don't care whether it's the Washington Post, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, or the, the New York Times, but yeah. And um, uh, I, I, I just don't have an answer for that. It's very troubling to me. As a perfect follow-up, how does the news media have to change and adapt, and what does it look like in the next decade? Um, well, you know, um, well, there, there's so many answers to that, and, and obviously we at the New York Times, um, you know, this is, that, that question has both financial implications and editorial ones. Um, so uh, financially, we have to find a sustainable model that isn't based on advertising um, because Google and Facebook have basically taken all of it. Um, uh, and what you can get for an online ad is a fraction of what you get for that full page Macy's ad. So um, the New York Times basically is going to a pay model. Um, and if you want the paper edition, it'll probably very soon cost you five or six dollars. Um, you'll, you'll have to actually pay the cost of, of doing that. Um, online will be a lot cheaper, but um, we're going to have to sustain ourselves by subscriptions. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but in terms of uh, content-wise, uh, I, I think the New York Times and, and other Washington Post, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, they're doing amazing stuff with video now and, and digital and being much faster and creating comment sections so readers can participate. I think good journalism in America today has never been better. And bad journalism has never been worse. Oh. Yeah, so. There's a question over on this side. Yeah. Um, I have a little fact to tell you that I think is going to make you happy, which is when you said no one has ever washed a rental car. <laughs> it's always you one. predicted. <laughs> My husband.
husband told me that he did it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have a question, which Please. is, um, because you have such an informed global perspective, I wonder if you thought about America's role in the world and whether there's a place for us without being the one superpower. And is there some other meaningful role we can play in the world? It just seems so scary that that is who we are in the world and we have to maintain that and we have to financially support it and intellectually, right. et cetera. Yeah. Is there some other meaningful way we right. can participate without that? And that's, it's a good question. People feel tired and I think that was reflected in this campaign and, uh, and some of the themes that Donald Trump you know, uh, evoked. Uh, but my short answer is no. Um, that um, if America goes weak and pulls in, um, your kids won't just grow up in a different America. They'll grow up in a different world. And it'll be a world ordered by China or Russia or much more likely nobody at all. And um, uh, if you didn't like a world of too much American power, I promise you, you will not like a world of too little American power. And, um, uh, and so, um, you know, we do some stupid things every once in a while, and I've even supported a few of them to my regrets, okay? But we also, um, uh, on balance, we provide enormous numbers of global public goods and create an environment where great organizations like the Gates Foundation and PATH can actually operate in the world. And um, uh, so I'm, I'm very worried about how we how we manage this um, going forward. Because um, what, what's always troubled me about this election and just the mood in the world right now is people are playing around with big systems. The EU, I don't like it, get rid of it. NATO, I'm tired of, I mean, Trump sort of talks about our alliances, I mean at times, like, like South Korea is a, uh, Korean barbecue in one of his towers, you know what I mean? Hey, you guys aren't paying enough rent, you know what I mean? Well, in, in, in the real, when that happens in Trump Tower, the guy gets evicted. What happens in the real world is the Korean goes out and gets a nuclear weapon. Oh, you're not gonna protect me? And then when he gets a nuclear weapon, the sushi restaurant next door also gets a nuclear weapon. And when the Chinese restaurant across the street sees that, it freaks out. So, you know, when we're paying a little extra to give them a nuclear umbrella so they all don't go out and get nukes, um, it may seem like we're paying inordinately, but in fact, it's so in our self-interest. And what, what worries me a little, and I've written this, um, is that, you know, Donald Trump comes out of the real estate world. The world of real estate is win-lose. In fact, the more Sue loses, if I'm selling her or buying her house, the more I win. Okay. Boy, did I steal that house from Sue. Geopolitics, when you're America, is about win-win, not win-lose. We invested billions of dollars in Europe in the Marshall Plan. We actually gave people, basically, money to build up Europe into a partner now, into the other great center of democratic capitalism in the world, which has made our world more secure, more stable, more liberal, and more prosperous over seven decades now. So if, if you approach everything as a win-lose um, and you're America, again, it's great in real estate, but when you're America, it's not, it's not in your self-interest. Yeah. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. The world, the thesis that you laid out, I'm on board for. Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems so much of this election and what we see um, in Europe with rising populism that's to the right, right in most countries is really in reaction and rejection to the, these sorts of forces. Yes. And so how much of what you've seen and what you've laid out do you feel is inevitable that is, is really just going to happen yeah. versus what can a sort of reaction against it potentially stop? Um, and then what would be the consequence? Well, it's a, it's a very good question, you know, um, and it's, the, in a way, the key question now in America and in, and in Europe. You know, you the, question? Uh, the question was, will I be signing books afterwards? And I am. <laughs> and she just asked it in a long-winded way, you know. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, 
Uh, <laughs> it's, it's basically, what are we going to do with this mess? You know, I mean, how do, we, <laughs> how do we end up not letting these trends consume everything that's good, you know? And uh, it's first, you know, I, I think having sympathy for people who are feeling these. When, when this many people are feeling something, you have to take it seriously. So, you know, what's going on? Um, uh, you know, I've said this or I've written, that, you know, people go into a supermarket now in Wilmer, Minnesota, a small town outside of Minneapolis where my aunt and uncle used to live, so I know it. Someone speaks Spanish to them. <laughs> or there's someone there with a different head covering and it's not a baseball cap. I celebrate that. I love that kind of world. And I'm so glad America can host it. But maybe some of those changes came for some people a little too fast. Um, you know, same with the whole uh, restroom question. Uh, I celebrate that we live in a world where people, uh, LGBT people, now can finally, they can feel at home. But these things come maybe too fast for some people. Then they go to work and a robot sits down to them, next to them, and seems to be studying their job. <laughs> and, um, and so if you think about what anchors people in the world, their community and their work, where they get their identity, both are being radically destabilized. And then someone comes along and says, I can stop the wind. Um, he can't stop the wind, in my view. Trying to will be very destabilizing. But that means I have to have an answer, too. It does not just enough for me to say, his idea won't work, you know. And um, I think so much, uh, and why I wrote this book, um, and I really didn't cover, I wrote about the election campaign, but I was busy writing this book because I was trying to figure out what world I'm living in because I've been really tracking the machine all this time. And, um, you know, our, our, it, our politics and our journalism, uh, you can get really lazy to now because if you just do dish in journalism, um, and I get plenty of it, you know, uh, I took that guy down, I trashed that person. I blogged against them, you know. Um, but who's out there reporting? Who's out there talking? Who's out there connecting the dots for people? That's our job. But people weren't doing that in this campaign. I mean, Trump was off really dividing people, and Hillary was off basically telling people how terrible Trump was. But if you were looking for navigation, how do I... I'm, I'm really feeling uprooted. There was nobody talking to you. And so uh, I will, you know, it, 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 what happens when the world gets this fast is that small errors in navigation can result in disastrous getting off track. It's like you're in a 747 and the pilot just enters one number wrong in the navigation and suddenly you find yourself radically off track. And that's just really worrisome. But there's something about this moment what really sort of bothers me about it where I'm not optimistic. It's just so easy to get ahead in politics and journalism now by being stupid, you know, and um, saying stupid things. And um, it's a real problem. We at the New York Times, you know, if you go online to the New York Times, we were talking about this this morning at the Gates Foundation a little. You know, we have on the, our homepage the most emailed items updated every 15 minutes. Any New York Times journalist or columnist who tells you they don't look at that list <laughs> is a liar, okay? <laughs> How can you not? Am I one of the top 10 or not? Am I, am I five? Am I going up? Am I going down? It's, a day. How can you, it's, it's like my book on Amazon. Where am I right now? It's, it's just like, um, so I've been at the New York Times 36 years. I'm an old fart. I'm at the tail end of my career probably. Um, I write whatever I want, you know. But if I'm a starting columnist, here's the problem. Will I write a column about Venezuela? We have a huge problem. Venezuela is melting down. It's a major country in our hemisphere that will spill instability north. If I write a column on Venezuela Wednesday, it won't see the bottom of the email list. Okay? Now, we have rival news organizations of the New York Times, major papers, good papers, they now have a scoreboard in their newsroom. Hey, Sue wrote that story. And Sue, you know, if we actually change the headline, we can goose it even more. So all the signals are, write about Donald Trump every day. 
Seriously, because then you'll, you'll go up the emails. Because if you're trashing Trump, you've got customers, okay? Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and um, so we're, there's, a, there's a really negative feedback loop developing here. And we make ourselves dumber and dumber because of that. And then we get really surprised um, by Venezuela or somebody else. So, um, so this is, this is a, it's, it's just a real challenge of leadership. And, and do we value... I mean, the tragedy of Hillary Clinton, to me, was she was trying to do that. She's a studious person. She was trying to be serious. And um, she got mocked for that, basically. Uh, and what's the lesson to the next person? You know, so um, I'm, I'm wrestling. My own little contribution is to spend three years writing a book trying to figure it out. I don't know whether I got it right or wrong, but I... I, I, I I, you know, people ask me if I'm an optimist or a pessimist, and I always quote my friend Amory Lovins, a great physicist, who says, um, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist, because they're just two different forms of fatalism. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> Everything's going to be awful. Um, so Amory's philosophy is, Amory says, I believe in applied hope. I'm hopeful, applied but hope. he understands you have to work for it, okay? It's just not going to happen. The Gates Foundation, it's built on applied hope. You know, they, they've got objective, they, they, they know where they're going, they want to go, but they know you got to get there, you know. And there's just too few, where I'm an optimist, because I don't want to leave you on the wrong message, and this is, because um, people say your book is an optimist guide. So where from comes your optimism? And it comes from um, my community, that what I've learned is if you want to be an optimist about America, stand on your head. Uh, come to Seattle. You can fill a room and have a serious discussion. There's actually communities all over the country who are doing amazing stuff. And I really profile what's going on in Minneapolis. Um, and uh, Because at the local level, politics is much less partisan. It's still, but, but, and people are actually coming together. They're not waiting for Washington. And I, the, the whole theme of the last part of the book is that the proper governing unit in the 21st century is not going to be the nation state uh, we'll still have national governments we need for army and for central bank. It's not going to be the single... Nation states, way too paralyzed and can't adapt fast enough. The single family can't adapt fast enough either, especially too many are single parent. It's the healthy community that's going to be the agent of governance in the age of acceleration. And the healthy communities that can help that you adapt, that take that public school and turn it into a 24-hour center for learning and community and connecting and respecting... Um, those are the, the real source of my optimism because they're all over the country. You're definitely and, uh, an optimist. Okay, <laughs> one more you. question, and then we yeah. need to get to, to your books. Yeah, don't go anywhere. Last mm -hmm. question. <laughs> don't forget the book. Mm. So, so in this age of lifelong learning that you've described, what do you think the role of K through 12 in college education is? How should it change? Um, you know, you still need it. Um, but it's just the days when you could do K through 12 and then four years and then dine out on it for 30 years is, is really not possible anymore. And I think we'll have to have a lot of changes because of that. I think what I argue in my Mother Nature's political party is that all post-secondary education should be tax deductible. How can you tell people you have to be a lifelong learner, but to take that $8,000 course, you have to earn $16,000? You know? And so to me, all post-secondary education should now be tax deductible, and we should find different ways to fill that in. But that's going to be the challenge, I think. Thank you very much. I'll be signing Thank books you. up here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.